Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling slightly overstimulated because it's the first kind of physical event that I've done for, for many, many months and very used to sitting in front of a screen doing this kind of, so I'm really finding sensory overload. So maybe we'll just take each other by the hand and gently walk through this. <laughs> So yeah, thank you for bearing with me while I feel, oh, real people. Um, my name's Caroline Till, um, and I've been invited to chair this amazing conversation with, with three incredible speakers this evening. Um, I'm the co-founder of Franklin Till. Uh, we're a futures research agency. Uh, we've been running for 15 years now. We specialize in uh, supporting mainly global brands and organizations to uh, work towards a more sustainable future. We specialize mainly in material innovation. So we work with um, the likes of Ikea, of Adidas, and really trying to intervene at all uh, aspects of their product life cycles and really uh, pushing them towards considering particularly the ways that they're making things and the materials that they're using to make and the messaging that they are giving out to their wider community. Um, we're also uh, working on a, an exciting project that I'd like to extend an invitation to you all if that's okay. So we, we've been curating an exhibition with the Barbican for the last two years uh, which will be opening in May called Our Time on Earth which is exploring this very very specific moment in time time in which we are you know on the cusp of complete climate collapse and actually what is the role of design of art and culture to help us actually imagine a different path and in particular a different relationship with our planet and really to, to remind us that we are living beings within a living planet and actually isn't that incredible and rather than you know this, this sort of fear mongering that often happens around the, the climate emergency agenda how we can actually open with awe and really think about um, sort of reconnecting to that sense of being living within a, li a living planet. So that sort of leads us uh, slightly into the conversation we're going to have today. So um, when I was, you know, reflecting, I have to say, on the tube journey on the way over about what we're going to talk about making and materials, I, I think about the time I spent uh, running a course called Material Futures at Central St. Martins, uh, working with some amazing students that were exploring the, the intersection of craft, science and technology to really think about the, the role of materials in taking us to a more sustainable future. And I think the thing that I found most inspiring working with those students and the methodology and the, the pedagogy that we were trying to emulate was thinking through making that rather than, uh, you know, doing, you know, well, there was deep research involved, but often those research processes were very much about getting their hands dirty at the start and really investigating materiality in a quite intuitive way. And through those explorations, coming up with very unexpected answers. And I suppose for, for me, just to sort of open this conversation as an opening gambit that we might extend further, maybe with one of these, some of these speakers is, you know, just the role of, of, of materials and making to, to keep our sense of autonomy, to keep um, experimentation and explore perhaps a less controlled sense of, of research and exploration and where that can lead us. Um, I've rambled enough. Um, I think the first thing that would be amazing to do is is introduce these three incredible speakers that are all coming from from very different perspectives. So um, today we have uh, Zoe Laughlin with us. Uh, we have Doug McMaster, and uh, we have Yasmina Chibitz. Um, and rather than do that painful thing where I read their bio in a very uh, sort of structured way because they're sitting right next to me and they know way more about themselves, I'm going to just hand straight over to each of them just to ask if you could do uh, a couple of minutes of introduction about about your work and then we'll jump straight into a question and then hopefully I would love to invite you all to you know really uh, probe our speakers more and uh, I'll be throwing questions over to you quite soon so Zoe if I can pass yeah. over to you hello um, I'm Zoe Laughlin I'm a co-founder and director of something called the Institute of Making and um, that is a proper thing uh, we're at part of University College London um, and we describe ourselves as a research club because although we are a group who do our own work, we also have a facility and a workshop and a materials library 
and allow other people at the university to use this space as a place of making and thinking through doing as Caroline mentioned, is one of our sort of central, central methodologies. Uh, so I run that project. So we do things in the public domain, we have the space, um, and I also celebrate materials and making in the public domain through making television programs, um, radio programs, giving talks, larking about, that kind of thing, <laughs> with materials. I've got, I've got some today. Oh, there was a material getting up to something. Yeah. Amazing, thank you, Zoe and Doug. Um, hello, everyone. I own a restaurant that doesn't have a bin. <clears throat> the uh, popular term for that um, is zero waste. Um, it's over in Hackneywick in East London. Um, <clears throat> Silo is almost a decade old now, and um, the, there is a, a unique perspective that um, that, that led to that um, scenario of not having a bin. I'm not going to go deep into that. So I'm going to wait for the next next bit of chat uh, to, to 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 share that perspective. But um, but yeah, it's a it's a casual fine dining restaurant, and um, perhaps to be more specific, it's 99.9% .9 binless, um, and um, both. Uh, in the back of the house, uh, there's a systemic uh, change um, from uh, every other restaurant in the world, um, which means that waste doesn't enter the building. Um, but then that idea goes into the very fabric of the, the restaurant. Uh, the whole restaurant is made from materials, uh, waste materials, regenerative materials, and natural materials. Um, and I guess the overall mission is to, to find a a harmony in the um, the environment, uh, integrate with nature, and um, yeah, s absorb some of that damage that we've done to the earth. Um, my name is Yasmina Sibitz. I'm a Slovenian artist. I'm living in London for the last twenty years. Um, sort of thinking how to kind of best enter into this straight into into this theme um, because I think I do fall out a little bit of it all. So I mostly work around the themes of soft power. So um, I'm a filmmaker, I make installations, I build a lot, I have a lot of bins. So um, I guess what I think could be quite interesting to kind of put out to, to debate to all of you is the ecology of art institutions and the, um, let's say, the recycling or let's say reenactment of ideas and artistic projects. So this has been within the art world quite a big problem from recycling walls to crates and so on. But um, still art institutions, public art institutions, let's not even go to the private ones, are constantly wanting new content. So if we are content providers here, and even if it is not necessarily about the materials, but about the ideas about intellectual discourse, how can we maybe rethink that ecology of you know renovating it, relaunching it, finding new audiences, and not always being pushed to reinvent ourselves with new new entities. Um, I think we have also a, a fourth speaker. Is it um, who is uh, Emmanuel, who's the director of um, uh, a college in Paris, and I, I believe he's got a, a response digitally. I think would would it be a good time to play that now? Can we do that? Okay, I'm just going to introduce him into the conversation as well, so that we can just bear his perspective in mind as we move forward. I'm looking if we want to make the most of making today, I think we have to pay attention to countryside. Rural areas have to deal with big contradictions. On the one hand, they catalyze various tensions, social, political, economic, which are linked to the shared feeling of a withdrawal of public services, economic and social life. More broadly, public authorities don't take into consideration ways of rural life, as if the countryside were blind spots or left out of modernity and public policies. On the other hand, rural areas are benefiting from renewed attractiveness, particularly from a population concerned about ecology and a more harmonious way of life. This trend has been strongly accentuated due to COVID. As a result of this contradictory situation, 
countryside can be considered as a social innovation laboratory. Why? Because it's a place where society and services are reinventing themselves. A place where people are searching for new ways of life. More than that, rural areas give us the opportunity to understand that the ecological crisis we are facing is a crisis of habitability. I mean, in the countryside, more than in the city, you experience daily that nature and culture are inseparable. You feel that you have to compose a common and habitable world with non-humans. You understand that the Earth is both something we used to live and a place where we live. So, from the point of view of a social and ecological laboratory, countryside is the place to be for designers of the 21st century. This is the background of the Design for Rural Worlds program we decided to set up last year in Nontron, which is a small town in Dordogne. As you know, design was born as a result of the Industrial Revolution. In a very close relation with dynamics of development, industrialization and urbanization. But today, one of the major challenges is how to live in a post-growth world with a new approach to development and industry. That's the reason why it's time to turn design against the world where it was born by activating its potential for social innovation and by reconnecting it to the old question of art of living, but taking into account the new ecological deal. If we want to address this challenge, we can learn from an English author, artist and designer, because he knew how to shed light on the blind spots of industrial modernity at the very moment when it was in full swing. I'm speaking about William Morris, whose famous dilemma is now more relevant than ever. How we live and how we might live. Okay, so that so that's an interesting opening gambit. So so in response to the the notion of making the most of making, um, Emmanuel is obviously has a, a very specific view about the role of rural hubs. I just want to throw that open to our speakers. Do you have is anybody um, got something to comment about this? From my perspective, I guess I'm very wedded to to urban hubs in terms of the the kind of small roots of innovation that they enable and and circularity etc. Has anybody else got any any responses to Emmanuel's approach to the role of making in the future? Well, it's making me think of Orwell's Roses. I don't know if you guys have read the recent novel, but um, it's it's a re interesting um, kind of connotation between kind of culture production, critical production, and the rural side. And well, especially within this country, you know, this this notion of rurality has been sort of a lot of the times kind of attached also to the upper classes. And also, and this is this kind of concept of this sort of rose as being something bourgeois that cannot be looked upon as as a kind of political discourse. And Orwell was a big uh, you know, fan of roses and he was kind of breeding them and so on. And of course, we then go to the famous um, um, suffragette quote, bread and roses. And, you know, if we kind of go beyond the whole kind of concept of, of uh, bread and circuses, which has been thrown around a lot, but we go back to bread and roses and think of, you know, of course we need bread, our publics need bread, but they also need roses. And maybe back at you guys, you know, this is this whole idea of like, you know, what kind of roses does the public want? Or is it our role or also do we dare as makers to propose those roses or do we leave it up to the audiences to decide what the roses they choose are? Zoe, what's your... I think um, I come from 
to both sides of my family are farmers, right? So I have a very rural background in many respects, and it's a very making orientated background. It's 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 people who go, oh, that's broken. Let me just jimmy that together and fix that. And a, a very engaged way of behaving with your environment that sees. Um, I remember my grandfather had there was like a water butt and there was a a downpipe coming off a roof gathering water and he'd taken an old hat and he'd lacquered it, cut a hole in it, flipped it upside down and it was using it as a funnel. So it's this kind of everyday improvisation that was part of how I saw my family interacting with stuff and things. And I also saw them interacting over a particular time frame. That was, again, sitting at the dinner table having conversations where my grandfather might be now. Now, Zoe, when you're 50, you need to cut this tree down. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, 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 okay. So you're like nine taking on this idea of that when you're 50, you've got to do something. And that was totally normal. And, like it, and, and the idea that now when I wake up dead, that means you need to do this. Like it was totally normal to talk about... 40, 50 year time frames, time frames about when I was old. Like, and um, then I enter the adult world and I realize that isn't normal. Like, lots of people don't have those conversations with their family and don't think about the world of stuff and things with the same kind of relationship to time and relationship to stuff. And it was quite rural in some respects, but it wasn't remote, I suppose. That's the other thing. Like, it, we're on the southeast coast and from the edge of our farm is the beach and on the beach you can see France and now you can see migrant boats and you know it's it's very connected and in the center of something yet it's still rural and I think it's an interesting thing to think of a new situation for designers to consider when I speak to young designers now I try to push forward this idea of you're not a designer or you're not an engineer you're a type of farmer you're a type of person with a responsibility to materials and processes where you might want to start thinking about 50-year conversations in your team and that when you take on some a young person in your team, you're telling them about things they need to do when you're dead. And like just a sort of, it's a provocation for a different mindset and we've sort of spoken about it before, but I think it is, for me, something that is a kind of post-COVID moment, that it is a chance to think about those different timeframes. And when we're in different locations and people have been moving out of cities and reimagining what does it might mean to live a fulfilled life mm. some of those questions maybe feel like they're having their moments um something that i'm not i'm sure it's not um just myself that uh, has observed but um we as humans have become quite detached from the nature um that feeds us the nature nature that we're part of um, and this urban life um, is the, I guess, the antithesis of, 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 of nature. It's uh, an abstraction from nature. If you think about urbanism or industrialism, it is uh, nature's demise. It is like cancer to nature. Wherever industrialism breeds, nature dies. Um, I think that's... It's quite a profound thing to say, but it's true. And it's hard to, I think, disagree with that. Um, and so, yes, of course, um, being in nature, reconnecting to nature will change our relationship to it. I think that uh, just to close the loop into, into waste, um, we, we waste things um, because we don't maybe have <clears throat> a great sensitivity to nature and its abundance or its lack of abundance. Um, we consider the things that nature creates a commodity and therefore it is expendable. We look at food as this fuel for us. We have um, spent too much time apart from this nature where we don't see ourselves as part of that system. So I think that, you know, just the, the sheer notion of having a walk in the, uh, in the countryside is, uh, is a very good idea, um, to say the very, very least. But I think that is a, a key distinction um, when it comes to urban and, um, I guess, rural life, um, is, is how we uh, relate to it and where we've gone wrong, where we've sort of um, taken the wrong path. Um, 
so so yeah and then just the last thing i just add is um the uh, speaking more literally um looking at industry uh the industry that is the most um uh, damned it, it, certainly in my 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 perspective my view of what i see in my world is you know cooking or hospitality is pretty tough and really really tough um but um but but farming or agriculture that's like next level i i i it's 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 such a sorry state of affairs when you consider you know how hard a, a farmer will uh, will work to to fill up a a little pot of milk and the value of that you know we add 43p value in our in our eyes in our in our expectations to milk something that uh, uh, comes out of a cow and yet coca-cola this this poison Sorry if anyone's got a can of Coke in the hand, um, is 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 more valuable, and that's um, this same parallel. It's the same abstraction. It's the same thing that we are getting wrong, and um, yeah, maybe a walk in the countryside would help us realign those views. I wanted to touch on um, like a slightly a peripheral conversation from from this, but related I guess to this notion of urban versus rural the we have in in this you know covid and hopefully moving towards post covid era relied more than ever on digital tools on digital technology to connect to work to and I just wanted to briefly ask you all um you know as people that are working in very physical realms with with you know physical materials and making in in a post-covid world that you know we have become very very reliant on digital tools what do you see the role of materials and making um well yeah it's this um connection to handmade tangibility um yeah reconnects us with process with raw materials with kind of the point i was just mm. making it, it reconnects us back to something more primal um yeah and and did you in a more literal sense as obviously in the hospitality industry that was heavily hit and probably still continues to be did you explore other service routes to to to, to connect with your community digitally or did you did you uh, you, know, you know did you just sort of say no we're pausing um because of the 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 this binless uh zero waste system we have it made doing deliveries quite difficult it, it wasn't right for us um but we yeah did a shop um but then more exciting and more relevant we opened um, a pottery above the restaurant um and pottery um if if any of you have ever dabbled in pottery it's um it's the best form of therapy it's uh, a really wonderful process and it is quite um revelatory every time you do this process your mind is so sort of focused in on this beautiful craft and you come out of it feeling like amazing and then i sort of question that a lot and um certainly appreciate um the value of of, of those sort of processes um, but yeah, that's what we did in, in, in COVID was the pottery is actually not um, destined just to make uh, pots from clay, but instead upcycle all of um, our waste glass. Uh, glass is the one material in our restaurant that's not compostable. So everything that comes through the front door is either compostable, whether it's food waste um, or say cardboard and it's all part of a composting system and there's no other material other than glass and uh, a single use that is and so we wanted a way of truly closing the loop on all of the materials that enter our space and that um, led to a very long um, adventure into crushing glass into a raw material the waste glass like wine bottles etc um, and then fusing that into things that we need. So plates, crockery, tableware, tiles, light fittings, and then closing the loop on every material completely. So there's no recycling, which is, yeah, the future of zero waste in my eyes. And how, just to briefly, how do you tell those stories? 
to is it important that you tell those stories to your customer do you use digital very, means very there important. yeah I, I i am um uh the the sort of brand ambassador that's why i'm here um it's my role to put it on social media and uh be here and talk about it um uh, so those spaces um online spaces is yeah uh, an opportunity to tell those stories that has done quite well yeah and yes, Mina, what about you in terms of the this digital existence that we're, you know, heavily reliant on? Is What's the relationship to your work there? Yeah, I think every, of course, every um, creative sector had a very, very particular encounter with a digital mm -hmm. realm, you know, and I think it is kind of so much dependent on whether, you know, it is about the physical materiality and how that got translated. And we always kind of had the joke, you know, between artist friends, kind of, have you started doing your watercolors yet, basically? <laughs> you know, it was no, like NFTs. How, how, <laughs> you, know, it, it, you know, how do you survive on that sort of small scale, especially if we're talking about London or, you know, anywhere around here, if you're not a blue chip artist, you don't have your, you you know, 20 assistants, it's a very, it's a small scale operation. So you have to be your brand ambassador, you have to be your PR machine, you have to be your maker, you have to be your assistant, sometimes with a pseudonym, you know, and it's how do you package all of that into a visual version of yourself? And I guess the biggest trick was how to maintain the integrity of the practice mm. in a very, very different changed world. And as I, I, I make quite big projects and it's films and I work with uh, spaces which are very difficult to access. Mm. The last film I did was in the United Nations building in Geneva. So it was things that I just could not access. Mm. So that was the biggest challenge and how to translate that into really a studio practice. So in a, in a strange way, you know, I kind of came back to, to materials for the first time, mm. got the hands dirty, you know, uh, which, which really kind of um, felt kind of in a way you know, sort of a revenge on the system as well, a system which was really failing us. So that was quite nice. And the other thing which was kind of a super surprise actually was that uh, what Zoom did enable was a lot of uh, visiting tutorials with students, art students all around the world. And this has been really quite amazing, extremely humbling because we managed to reach um, students, art students that we otherwise would never be able to because universities cannot pay you know, even travel fees for, for other artists to travel in and, 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 and work with artists. And it's been definitely the period that I've never before known depressed students. Mm. So this, this was, as I said, like very humbling and just felt as a kind of very important part of this kind of new ecosystem of, mm. of solidarity and exchange. And Zoe, I think one of the the I think back to an event that I attended several years ago that you guys ran um at the Institute of Materials which is still probably the, my most favorite event I've ever been to it was the one uh, I can't remember the thematic maybe it was human or s uh, flesh it was skin and you had bodybuilders walking around and we were able to uh, do incisions with a plastic surgeon and while being served like plates of uh, cured meat at the same time I mean it was the most like multi-sensorial event and I learned more about flesh than I would have done from any kind of you know book or lecture and so I'm just really interested you know those really visceral events I mean how have you been operating in the digital sense or, or do you not find that relevant I mean that was that was flesh 2008 I think amazingly right. yeah I still remember it as the highlight of yeah and it was it was a it was it sort of sums up a lot of our methodology which is real physical stuff in a real physical space as seen and experienced from as many different perspectives as we can consider over that topic, right? So if we do a thing on sharpness, we'll have physicists who'll know about like atom thick steel and we'll have butchers there explaining, we'll have hairdressers explaining angle of attack for cutting hair. Like we just come at things from a very broad base. I'm still reeling from the idea that I can fake a PA and I might make a pseudonym for myself. <laughs> How have I never thought of this? This is absolutely genius. What should we call them? They may be the whole be accounts French. department. A whole. I know yeah. this could be just. This could be. This, someone else is answering my email. <laughs> Zoe isn't possibly able to do that. <gasps> my God! Right. Sorry. That was just such a moment that I was. That I just needed to say it out loud to remind myself that is the future. Um, so digital tools. Yes, with real physical stuff in a real physical space. So being detached from our space and our stuff is like what's the point of us but you know we use digital tools all the time and they range from you know email to a cnc programmable mill but they're tools and 
the, it was it was an exciting opportunity to say, okay, we've got a new range of tools at our disposal. We can put things on online. And, um, you know, I, I'm lucky enough to, as I mentioned at the top, had some experience on TV. So I know the, the camera is a medium a bit. And that, okay, we're now all on TV, right? And maybe we can do all our things with three cameras. We'll have the laptop there, we have a close up here, and we have our phone as an overhead one, and we'll use these different perspectives. And maybe there are things that we can show you on a screen that aren't, I couldn't show you in a space. So we started doing things that were very, very small so that we could be very close up and you could really like see it big on your screen. Or things also that use time differently. Because before, if you'd come to a thing, it would be like, it starts at this time and then it ends at that time. And it's like, you've got this event time that's bracketed by start and finish. But if you're at home and time is what you decide, actually, it could be every Thursday for two for four sessions. And it, it, you can come back to it. So we started doing things where like time became part of the process. So we did things like dyeing workshops where you would do for, we did first session one was foraging then you had to pickle things then you had to cure things and then you had to leave it for two weeks to steep see you in two weeks so your you know the audience and the event time could be pulled and stretched in a very different way than it would at an occasion uh without sort of yeah and people were sort of up for signing up for those sorts of experiences because uh, you know, what else were they going to do? But I do remember it, there was a terrible moment. It was like September 2020 when I realized like all work is computer work now. And that was a very sort of like, oh, kind of moment. Mm. Whereas before, I will give a talk and then in the workshop mm. and then some emails. And it was like, well, no, the talk, the emails, the fun workshop, the, it, all were down that lens. And then it was like, oh, maybe we've had enough. But, you yeah. know, we kept going. But it's, it's, it's a tool and I think we tried our best to play with it. And is there anything, any ways of working that you guys, so for example, Doug, are you carrying on with the pottery studio upstairs? Have there, have there been some positive things that have come out in this, this adaptation, the ingenuity that you've all kind of responded in your own practices and your businesses? Um, absolutely, yeah. Well, just the whole process is um, uh, is quite unusual, uh, especially uh, just with a glass crushing glass. Um, to see an empty wine bottle as a raw material um, to crush it and then to then um, build up with it um, is a very unique process. Um, and I believe that there's 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 artists making things from crushed glass. But never as part of a um, uh, an ecosystem of zero waste a, a, in this way, and yeah, there's just no um, information out there to to our knowledge. Um, we we're just in this field with no experience and just kind of intuitively kind of leaping forward and hoping that things work and you know the trial and error the the infinite variables with melting glass different colored glass different particle sizes and then trying to fuse it and form it into things that are not only useful but beautiful and valuable that process is um yeah seemingly infinite and i feel like we're maybe only one percent of the journey into it but it's uh, very exciting and yeah can, um, just on glass, because I think at the top of this whole thing, I was thinking about the topic of materials in the post-pandemic age and making in the post-pandemic age. And I had a kind of like thoughts process in my head that came from standing kind of in my studio, looking at some things and collecting them for today, thinking somehow that talks about things I want to talk about, which is material persistence, the raw, the fake, and the fixed. So we may come onto those things, but I want one of them is glass. So I thought, you've mentioned glass, so I wanted to bring it out. Mm. And this was in the material persistence, right? This has persisted. This is over 2,000 years old. <laughs> she says it's going to drop it. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is a piece of Roman glass, which was like a little teacher bottle for a medicine, so we think. But that that is nearly 2,000 years old, and is extremely immutable. And it, w although glass in one respect is fragile, like we've all broken something made of glass. We know how I could quite easily break that in one way. Actually, it's extremely inert. And if it just sits there and no one kicks it on the floor whilst it's on the floor, it's gonna be absolutely fine for like thousands more years. And there's something about both 
the recyclability or in the sense of the processability of it and then the stability of it that I think is kind of interesting. Like that's perfectly fine and happy just there. Thank you. It's not anyway, so I'm gonna leave it there for fun. Well they can't see it. Shall we put it we've got anything to put it on? No, never mind. I'll hold it up one more time for those at the back. There you go. There you go, matey. But you'll be good. Have you got anything else in your bag of tricks? Well, you know, <laughs> let's see what else comes up. Yeah. Do you want me to yeah, you yeah, keep okay. going? Okay. If, if you'd like to. Well, yep. Yeah, okay. Here we go. The raw. So materials persistence. We've had something very persistent. Let's have something raw. Because I think this sort of taps into that nature business, right? Mm. And I think it's it's all too easy to kind of think, to then leap from nature to natural, which makes me vomit a little bit, to then good, you know? That's like, well, I tell you lots of natural things which will kill you, right? If I brought out some asbestos right now and started sprinkling it around, you wouldn't be very happy. Um, it, it, just because it's naturally occurring doesn't mean it's good. Also because something, what is natural is quite subjective. And I think that, it's all too easy within a kind of design paradigm to kind of align things that are sort of both brown and natural to somehow be better than things that aren't. Um, anyway, so what is raw though is actually, is actually the point because I don't, it's all a sort of, a, oh, hang on, I'm, I'm having trouble because I've wrapped it, because I was so worried about breaking the glass, I've wrapped it in like 15 tea towels. Got it. <laughs> but uh, so uh, the, the notion of this is trying to represent materials are, are themselves a process and they're in process of making and things are always being made and unmade continuously depending on what environment they're in but this is a, a rock called malachite which is the ore of copper so copper as we know it as an element on the periodic table is extracted from this rock but this rock has gone through a geological process of making and if it hadn't been mined in the ground, it would have still been going through that process. But then it's gone through a process of mining and extraction and commodification. And people probably died getting this out of the ground for us. And I've now got it because it's been traded and it exists. But if you wanted to turn it into copper, you have to process it with huge amounts of carbon and, and heat and it rip the oxygen away. And then you start to get like, where's the next little guy? Is he here or she? Who knows? Didn't mean to gender it, sorry. But it's coming. There it is. So then here's then once you've sort of burnt it, for want of a better description, you get the slag in which there is actual recognizable bits of metal appearing, you know, shiny brown copper. And then this needs to go through another process of of smelting to and purity removal. And then it becomes made into things that will become new raw materials for other types of processes. So if I'm working in engineering and I want to make some new alloy and I'm gonna mix some copper with some tin or something, and what I'll do is I'll order some copper powder because I can then measure 10 grams of copper powder much more easily if it's in a powder form. Think about cooking, it's, you, know, you can weigh out a powdered ingredient much more easily than chopping it off a block of something. You know, if you're weighing out some butter, you obviously take a bit of, oh, too much butter, not enough butter. Same with like copper, oh, I've sawn off too much from this ingot or whatever. You deal with powders because it's jolly easy to mix them up and make absolutely the exact repeatable mixtures of it. But that powder, I mean, making copper powder, that's a huge process of making. And so that's, again, that's not a raw material. It's a made thing, it's an object in that respect. and. It also, these things aren't stable. Like you make that thing out of copper and then in 20 years time, it's sort of tarnished and it's slowly wanting to return back to its ore. And actually it's very unlike this glass thing of like, if it's in the ground, actually it's just gonna disappear and not be there. But um, anyway, so that's the sort of, the debunking of the raw maybe. Like everything's raw. If we look at it in, mm. in that sort of continual processing kind of way. Um, I'm just aware of that we're I'm I'm ruling these speakers. Has anybody does anybody want has anybody got any questions? I mean I could keep going with mine, but has anybody got any questions they want to throw in? I'm also aware I don't have a clock in this room, so I might need somebody to give me a little wave when we've got sort of five minutes left. Yes. I have a question for you. I'm a designer, I work with a thick glass, so I 
I think the French word is recuperate. I find 200 year old necklaces and I destroy them and I make new design. But I want to know what is the responsibility of the multinational corporations like you mentioned who work with IKEA, mm -hmm. Adidas, because I feel not only as educators and parents, but we need another um, leg on the stool from multinational corporations, not only to do marketing and satisfy the shareholders, but educate the consumer. I mean, how many pairs of trainers a teenager needs? <laughs> and I'm infuriated by that because I grew up with two pairs of trainers and that was more than enough. It was a luxury. Yeah. And I feel that the multinational corporations are not taking the responsibility of overconsumption that is sickening mm -hmm. and it's a moral vacuum that then you end up with depressing adults that it all starts with the social media and they're just taking advantage of the vulnerable age of teenagers and it's disgusting to see. And as a parent, you need to be the old one out, the moralistic, the one pair is enough and then, well, one is more basketball and ten is and football and I think they're like superhumans, but they're just saying keep doing sports. So my question is, when are you going to take responsibility of educating the consumer along with us and not at any stop? Yeah, I mean, that is a no, no, great, great question. Um, so, I mean, I can answer it from the perspective of the work that we, I get everything that we're doing with, uh, we work with major corporations because we believe that they can make the most change effectively and they have the most responsibility. They have the burden of the most responsibility. Um, the, the things that we're continually saying to the likes of Adidas is cut your product lines. Absolutely. The fact we've got to actually shift to completely new service models. We've got to um, reconsider everything from the very bottom up. And um, I've just been through a really interesting kind of introspective uh, year um, on a personal level because we've got very tired of reaching this point. Like a lot of the work that we're doing, I believe in the power of, of design, of making to seduce that there is another way of doing things that actually, um, rather than, I mean, legislation is really important to actually show that we need to act with restriction now because uh, we are extracting raw materials as if they are, you know, infinite. Um, but I also believe in the power of design to find alternative, you know, to so broaden the palette of materials, um, work, you know, think about um, take back schemes, work, you know, a lot of the work that we're doing is actually just looking at all aspects of the circular economy and how you can use that biological uh, cycle as well as the technical cycle and what, you know, who are the, the leading material technologists, who are the scientists that these companies need to work with. But often, when we're, we've developed a plat, you know, we've done a huge amount of research, we've developed a platform for innovation, and we've said, right, this is, the, the answer is often, um, but is that going to cost us more money? And that is the, that is the problem that we have at the moment. So, um, and I guess it goes back to the, uh, the, this, this relationship to nature has been discussed. And for me, this is where we are, that I'm, there's an incredible uh, ecological theorist um, called Joanna Macy. I don't know if anyone knows her work. Who's been inspiring me greatly? Uh, she talks about the great turning. She says that we are, and I guess what we're talking about here is the roles of material in making and responding to, to climate emergency, in in essence. And she says that this is an incredible time to be alive. Wouldn't it be amazing if we? you know, we are part of what could be the most amazing story ever told, that we shifted this ship from the point of collapse and we, and we, re and there's three things that she put, talks about the great turning, she, uh, holding actions, which is basically act activism, legislation, um, alternative systems and structures, which for me is some of the material innovation that, that, that we're working with that people like, I can see a very um, good friend, uh, Professor Becky Early and her uh, Centre for Circular Design are working on. So, so the alternatives that actually are going to do less harm or or even regenerate, ideally. And then the third thing is the shift in consciousness. And for me, that's the thing I'm really interested at this point is, um, and I've been involved in a program called the Bio Leadership um, Fellowship. And it's basically bringing together people from all over the world who are working in what we call the sustainable agenda, I suppose, and trying to 
uh, somebody's holding a clock up. Uh, but basically, I, I believe that there is that what we need is a shift in consciousness for all of us as individuals, at, but mainly, you know, people in positions of power as well to 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 have this basic realization that we are a living entity within a living system we're completely disconnected in the western world from that not not you know we've been working with some incredible indigenous communities that say actually you know this is not our problem this is your problem yeah and we need a complete shift in consciousness and i hope you know in this this we're, we've been asked to talk about a post-covid future i think covid has has given us an incredible kind of opportunity to almost it's been very very challenging for many people but it's shown us a portal into a into a, a different way into a pause into a you know we've seen that actually nature can regenerate in a, even in a rel relatively short space of time if we stop driving so many cars on the road and things like that so I, i'm answering your question in a very fluffy way but um those three points are the things that help me get up in the morning and keep going. This, this holding actions, these alternative systems and structures, and this, this what, personally for me, my, my, is this shift in consciousness, which is all about realizing that we are living and behave, we need to behave as if we are living within a living planet. Um, I don't know if I've ranted on a bit there. If that anybody. Was great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> This is repair, right? And th I mean, these are um, clamps that surgeons use when they're suturing someone. <laughs> Back to flesh. But they're a really amazing tool if you're doing any kind of serious hardcore sewing where you've got to grab hold of a needle and like yank it through 10 layers of something, you know? Mm -hmm. And like be having a sense of you can fix a thing and mm -hmm. keep it going, mentioning, you know, my family and the farm and like you've got a tractor you've got to work it's all right stopped how are we going to fix it right here right now but I know that that's something I'm more comfortable with than others but having that sense in which the most important thing you can do to a thing is prolong its life mm. and fix it then you might think about how else you might use it and then you might think well we can't use this anymore we've got to grind it down but all of that uses much more energy than fixing it and so there's you know new legislation coming in around the right to repair and that because of the, it's something you have to tackle at a legislative level that says to companies you can't make that thing where we can't change the battery anymore it's not good enough that the only reason i need a new phone is that this won't won't hold charge when i could open this up and swap the battery out and have an it will keep going for another two years like that is the only reason really why your phones aren't as good as they were isn't it's not a software thing it's a battery thing and the, the, you're not allowed to change them so like just the, those those big things are a legislation thing i think and so they, there is a role for that for corporations to kind of push things along because they'll say consumers will demand it but i'll say we just we're stupid and it's always oh, a pink one and I, I haven't had seen a pink one before that's nice like you know what i mean like we they know how to manipulate us so well that they might tell us that we've got a choice and then they give then they give us too much choice and we you know what I mean like it's, you can't, some things you mustn't have a choice about I think I'm very much aware that I'm getting signals um is there any any for just final notes from from our speakers Even, no okay everybody um but sorry I'm uh, to to uh, cut things a bit shorter I think we were just getting into some juicy stuff so um you know we will be hanging around if anyone wants to come forward and ask any further questions um but hopefully we've just given you a bit of food for thought thinking about actually what are the roles and materials are making in this post well beyond post covid because actually covid is just one of the small challenges that we're going to be facing and and perhaps actually this this idea of materiality of making giving us autonomy and I I think one of the things that really struck me today hearing these three incredible speakers is adaptability i think that's something that's got you know fluidity and adaptability to adapt to the, the many challenges and actually the role of of creativity and ingenuity in that um, and that's one of the things that i would take away from listening to you all so thank you so much so thank you very much for your attention and uh, sorry we've run over a bit can i also do a shout out i'm we're going on to other things are you going on as well to yasmina like uh, greg's Bit going on to something else at eight. I'm about to be interviewed at eight. So if you want to hear more from me, I don't know which room. <laughs> I don't know, but it's eight o'clock. Um, I'm going to be talking more. So the, the conversation can continue in another different form.
So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, Brilliant. Sorry, yeah. Thank you. I was supposed to do this at the beginning, but um, we ran over, so I'll do it at the end. But I wrote a poem about the theme that these guys are talking about today. It's going to take up one minute of your good time. So um, it's called Making the Most of Making. Mix the language with the mood. I make myself better. Today, I'll stencil a smile onto the window and wish the people a satisfying day. There's nothing more to be said, only to be made. The universe stands as a singular artist. I want to invent the watercolors of a Cambodian rice field, a room with a view. Around the circle, we give each other gifts. Say we made a thing which didn't exist before, brought to life an idea. And through this, I give you that which gives you more of yourself. Feast on the spectacular, mold the cold clay, Knit slower, dance until the floorboards stand in applause. In my pocket, I'll keep my small life for when I most need it. I've sold my cruelty, the first records I ever bought. I'm free as the pots left outside. Wherever one whistle goes, another follows. Imagine everything around us once started off in someone's mind. I want to pull the stars out of the sky one by one. But I wouldn't know what to do with so much darkness. So I keep my shoes clean. Iron what I can. I'll take my damage to the golden line. Delete my battle name and speak straight from the hip. Look what I made out of love. Look what you gave out of love. Look up. The love hasn't moved since the beginning.